Previously on The Richie Show. And now, ninjas. Okay, we're back. I made myself some vanilla pudding. And we are going to continue on with the history of Power Rangers. Mighty Morphin Season 3. Now, again, just from what I can remember, um, Season 3 came after uh, the Mighty Morphin Power Rangers movie. Um, and, you know, in that one, they, they faced Ivan Ooze and all that, and they got these, like, ninja powers and stuff like that. From what I can remember, that's basically what happens in... in, uh... In season three, they basically just <laughs> do a rehash of the the story of Mighty Morphin Power Rangers, the movie. But you know, the movie isn't in the same continuity as the show. So, yeah, Mighty Morphin Power Rangers season three from Linkara's History of Power Rangers. Here we go. Oh, and I remember those. Oh my god, Ninja Zombie Power Rangers! This show is friggin' awesome! <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen and others, welcome to Mighty Morphin Power Rangers Season 3. Go, go, Power Rangers! Season 3 opens on the planet Edenoi, where Alpha was originally built. Count Dragon has enslaved the populace in footage that looks even older than the Jew Ranger stuff used for season one of Power Rangers. The opening three episodes are called A Friend in Need, which serves as a backdoor pilot for a Power Rangers-like show called Masked Rider. Like Power Rangers, it would use Japanese footage with American actors. It only lasted a year, and all in all wasn't exactly anything to write home about. The show, when released, pretty much removed any references to Power Rangers, mostly because at the time, Power Rangers Rangers ratings were starting to decline. What gets me is that Saban apparently has a library of background music that they sometimes reuse. The music used in these three episodes I'd later hear in the dubbed version of Digimon. Don't get me wrong, I actually really like the music, it's just I keep hearing it and expecting Myotismon to suddenly attack. Speaking of the music, I need to quickly cover something that I failed to talk about in the last two videos. Ron Wasserman. Ron Wasserman was the composer for the series' most memorable tunes, both in fight scenes and the original Go Go Power Rangers theme. While he didn't compose the music for every season, almost every time he did over the course of the show's run, you'd still be guaranteed something catchy and exciting. Anyway, Alpha is depressed because he received a distress call from Edenoi. Zed is also observing the attack and laments the fact that Count Dragon has been successful in pretty much conquering Edenoi, and yet he and Rita continue to have problems with Earth. The two are apparently rivals, which explains why they never mention him after this three-parter. <laughs> the Rangers want to know if they can help, save for Kimberly, who is stuck in bed, sick. Zordon lets them go to Edenoi, but warns them that the great distance might mean that their powers may not be at full strength. Not that that will actually make a difference in the episode, nor does it make any sense since, spoilers, there are alien Power Rangers. And if they're all connected to the morphing grid, then, well, what difference does it make? After a brief misunderstanding with the Masked Rider, the groups get together and reveal their identities to each other. The Masked Rider is Prince Dex, and boy, hearing him speak just makes me realize how much has changed with the Rangers. In the early days, their acting wasn't all that great, but they got better over time. Dex just sounds really silly when he talks, kind of like he's not sure whether to take his dialogue seriously or not. Mind crystals. They give us the ability to communicate our thoughts as well as images. And I remain an outlaw under the guise of the mass writer, trying to bring some sense of hope to our people. You have your wish, you lonesome barbarians. Anyway, they fight some masked rider villains and they leave. Yeah, that was worth devoting a three-parter to. They just go there the and voice. then back to Earth and fight the monster. A the voice doesn't match the guy, or, or like the, the masked rider costume, like like that nasally voice, it just doesn't, it doesn't gel well with the look of, of that character, the, the masked writer, it, it just, <laughs> oh my god, anyway, sorry. Repaint of another monster they fought in season two, and, and uh, oh my god, 
New Zord footage again! Ooh. It really took them three damn seasons to finally get this footage, and it's such a nice change of pace. Sure, the sparks that explode off aren't what you normally see in the Sentai footage, but like I care, it's new. With Dragon heading to Earth in pursuit of the Rangers, Dex is sent to Earth for his spinoff that will, again, never mention the Power Rangers, despite the fact that we now have two colossally evil forces trying to enslave mankind. A friend in need isn't a strong start to the season and is best just skipped over, frankly. It's not that it's that bad, just that it doesn't really serve any purpose for the show other than acting as a pilot for another show that would never mention them. That being said, there would be a comic book crossover between Masked Rider and Power Rangers later, but the canonicity there is questionable. Instead, the real start for the season is a four-parter that details the next evolution of the show, Ninja Quest. Rito Revolto, Rita's brother, arrives at the palace with a number of eggs and promises to Holy deal with the Power Rangers. Rito's an idiot through and through, but he's roughly on par with Goldar in terms of power levels, and he leads a bunch of monsters down to confront the Rangers. Meanwhile, Bulk and Skull, having given up on finding out who the Rangers are, Skull in particular seems sick of their constant failure, over here two girls talking about how they love men in uniforms. Seeing an ad for the Junior Police Patrol, they announced to the shock and amazement of the Juice Bar that they plan to join them. Obviously with the intent of picking up women. I'll get more into this when we talk about their development this season. Is really, this is just surprising because it's a shock to learn that police even exist in Power Rangers. So Rito fights the Rangers. I thought I saw Richie. The, the uh, completely unnecessary character that was introduced last season. Hang on. Yeah, I think that's Richie. <laughs> wow. So Rito fights the Rangers with the monsters, doing serious damage to the Zords. Alpha tries to boost their energy, but the Technobabble once it does something, causing some kind of power surge that overloads and strips the Rangers of their powers. Well, at least we have these Zord suits now, and we could still have original Zord fight. Well, crap. Damn. I will say that actually seeing the Zords falling apart like this with wires strewn everywhere and just falling to pieces, it's a pretty disturbing image, on par with the original Megazord getting sliced apart back in Doomsday. I should note that they don't explicitly say that there's a power surge, but it's what seems to be inferred by the dialogue. That levels need to stabilize, a bar of lights going into the red, things overloading and exploding, that kind of thing. So how would that strip them of their powers, since those are supposed to be tied into the power coins? Well, recall that last season, when the team got the Thunder Zords, it was said that Tommy no longer had enough power to support a new Zord. It's possible that their powers, while based on the coins, are tied into the Zords. Remember also that the Thunder Zords are actually transformed versions of their original Zords, and when they're destroyed in the Power Surge, it wrecked their powers too. Mind you, they very likely also function independently of the Zords, just that when the Zords are active, their powers are linked together, and damaging one damages the other. It's gonna be a long walk back to the command center. Let's get going. Man, if only we had some kind of flying car we could use to get there. The command center is pretty trash too, and it's clear there's no way to restore their powers with everything in its current state. Adam asks where the powers originally came from, and Zordon explains that, according to legend, the power coins were originally forged by an entity named Ninjor, who created them and the Zords to be used as tools in the fight against evil. Alpha says that they also found a map through the Desert of Despair, where Ninjor's temple is supposed to be located along with the power coins. This is really an interesting premise, that Zordon didn't create the power coins, and that they were actually found by him and Alpha. While they know an awful lot about them and how they work, they might not know everything about them. This could be very useful down the road when we reach certain episodes where they use the old powers again, but we'll get to that when they come. More than that, there may have been different versions of the Mighty Morphin suits in ancient history, and that they're actually reflective of the period and people who use them. After all, in Wild West Rangers, when Kim gave the ancestors the coins, their versions of the suits had a Wild West theme to them without anything to suggest why that should be. The Rangers travel to the Desert of Despair, which looks exactly like the desert outside the command center. I wonder if Zordon was just screwing with the rangers when he said it may only be a myth and that they knew exactly where the temple was. Zordon just wanted to get back at them for wrecking his stuff. 
The eggs on the moon hatch, and they're revealed to be Tanga warriors, giant crows that are apparently fierce warriors. They will be the new foot soldiers of the season. Although, personally, I thought the putties were more intimidating, even if they started to become a bunch of really disturbing interpretive dancers near the end of their tenure. <laughs> the rangers wander the desert, losing the map to a fire thanks to the dangers of the area, until they come upon the rocks where Kirk fought the lizard in Star Trek. Yeah. Oh, but I kid about Vasquez rocks. That's where the command center is. The Tengas attack, and apparently losing their powers, also made them lose their martial arts skills since they put up a pitiful defense against the birds before finding the entrance to the temple. Also, Vasquez Rocks is where uh, Bill and Ted's evil robot selves killed the actual Bill and Ted. They th threw them off a cliff. Catch you later, Bill and Ted! Anyway, back to this. The Tengas are too big to fit through, and obviously too dumb, since all they'd need to do is turn to their sides to get in, but for plot convenience, that's what you got. The rangers travel through a tunnel until reaching the temple of Ninjor itself. They find Ninjor inside of a bottle, and it turns out he's voiced by Dudley Do-Right. Why, you snippety upstart, you happen to be looking at him! I am the great Ninjor! Nin Ninjor sounds like Marvin the Martian. <laughs> Ninjor at first refuses to help, but Tommy makes a little speech about how they'll still fight even without their powers. Remember this for a future installment. However, this is of course a test and Ninjor grants them ninja powers. Since of course, ninjas wear bright yellow or blue. Now I suppose they do look cool at the very least. They're also assigned new animal zords. Well, before your power came from the brute strength of the dinosaurs, now it comes from the swift, intelligent cunning of the ninja. The Seriously, he sounds like Marvin the Martian. <laughs> oh, the swift power of the ninja. Ain't it lovely? Oh, the zords are destroyed. That makes me very angry. <laughs> oh, that dastardly rabbit. This is more than a restoration of your range of powers. Your new power coins come with new, more advanced powers. Rocky is given the Ape Zord, Aisha the Bear Zord, Billy the Wolf Zord, Kimberly the Crane Zord, Adam the Frog Zord. I'm a frog. And I joke about the frog thing, but while it's a funny line in the movie, the show actually bothers to not make its heroes into a punchline, describing the frog as courageous. The ninja suits you see in the sequence are not a one-off either. They're basically an alternate morphed form for them that grants them extra abilities like super speed, being hidden in the dirt, or swapping out their costumes for a fake. While they weren't often used, it was kind of a precursor to the civilian powers displayed in later series. However, the difference here, and why I'm fine with it in this instead of in those, is that they're still in a different morphed form. In terms of combat style, there was also an evolution in how they fought. While, of course, the rangers always acted as a team, while in their ninja forms, they seemed more likely to interact with each other and perform more complex maneuvers involving at least two people. What's weird in this case, however, is that they morph into their old costumes. Seriously, what the hell? Give them new helmets, at least. Did they blow the budget on the ninja suits and the Zord suits that got destroyed only four episodes in? I mean, at this point, they're not using Sentai footage for the Rangers anyway, so why not just build some new helmets? Sure, for toys, they'd have to alter the head mold a little, but it's not too drastic a change. I just realized uh, when Tommy in his ninja form does the, the morphing sequence. He looks like a clansman. Oh, that's 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 creepy. Sorry, I just it just like I, I, am I wrong? Am I like he looked like a clansman. <sighs> oh well. <sighs> that's a creepy thought.
That being said, while they've kept the same outfits, they alter the morphing phrases. Instead of calling out their animal, it's Pink Ranger Power and Black Ranger Power. And good thing they included the ranger part, since it might be a bit awkward for Tommy to yell out White Power. Also surprisingly, they decided exactly. to keep Titanus around this season and use the Ultra Zord with the Ninja Megazord, despite the fact that Titanus was from footage from a totally different Sentai. How do they accomplish this effect? They put the toys together, <laughs> even though they don't look like the Zords from the Sentai footage at all. But yeah, they defeat Rito, but he sticks around as a comic relief counterpart to Goldar. And I love Rito. Aside from just his very cool design, gotta show love for skeletons, while he's a moron, he's still a viable threat who could do some damage. And while I, of course, prefer a more menacing Lord Zed, the fact that he gets under Zed's well, skin, I guess, for lack of a better term, is greatly amusing. Ninjor also sticks around as an ally of the Rangers, even being able to grow himself into a larger, kinda, sorta, Zord mode. The need for him to stick around is pretty much because of the Sentai footage, taken from the series Kaku Ranger. Ninjor's design is very much fascinating in relation to Power Rangers mythology. While he's from a series completely unrelated to Ju Ranger, the fact that Sentai has very similar designs for the majority of their series, multicolored outfits, its black visor, rounded helmet, could imply that Ninjor built other ancient Power Rangers before. Future series would describe other events that happened in history from various time frames, 3,000 years ago, 10,000 years ago, etc., and powers that don't have a fully fleshed out origin, just that they are very old. And according to events later this season, we know that the Power Coins were not the only Power Rangers paraphernalia that Ninjor has made before. After a lengthy amount of filler episodes, the next major story arc begins with, believe it or not, a white cat. Aisha adopts the cat, but we quickly learn that Rita has plans with it. As the rangers battle Rito, the cat transforms into a woman who watches intently. We also what? learn that Kimberly has been working hard on her gymnastics, which will pay off as part of the story arc. The cat, named of course Cat or Catherine, is an Australian teen under Rita's spell. She goes to Tommy to begin the diabolical scheme. Excuse me. I was wondering, I'm new here, my car's broken down outside and I really don't know what to do. Certainly, mysterious girl who I've never met before, whose eyes glow red, I'll take a look at your car despite the fact that there's no way you could know that I'm in any way mechanically inclined or that I could be of more use to your car than a mechanic. After such a it's clever ruse, the two get trapped in some sort of alternate dimension and Tommy hell? is knocked out. While the other rangers <laughs> work to free Tommy using one of Billy's devices, Tommy morphs and fights Goldar and Rito. While they're able to free Tommy, Tommy, Catherine remains under Rita and Zed's control, and the villains start working on long-term plans. This story arc has some really great moments, especially in later episodes. Also, I love the self-referential humor, like this bit. What is it this time, Fister? A monster that blows itself up! The next phase of the arc comes in the three-part Changing of the Zords, where Finster reveals that he's discovered the location of a group of dormant Shogun Zords. He thinks that by combining the technology of the Ninja Zords along with these dormant Zords, Zed and Rita could have their own set of Zords to be used against the Rangers and Earth. No one points out that Zed should really just work on getting new batteries for Serpentera, since the thing's still more powerful than the Rangers' Zords, but whatever. Also, one wonders where exactly these Zords came from originally. Again, tying into the fact that the Mighty Morphin Team was not the first Power Rangers ever to exist. Rita orders Cat to steal one of the Rangers' power coins so they can gain access to the Ninja Zord technology, since it seems that, like the original Zords, their powers are tied into the big robots. During an attack by the Tengas, she steals Kimberly's power coin. As established when Tommy first lost the Green Ranger powers, being a Power Ranger infuses you with that power, probably tying you in directly to the morphing grid. And if you are somehow removed from that power source, it can harm you, as it does for Kimberly when she's separated from it. Cat also starts falling for Tommy, her jealousy of Kim's relationship with him helping fuel her actions. During an attack by Goldar, Cat steals the Falcon Zord, and Ninjor is abducted by Zed to be used as the power source for the new Zords. So, needless to say, the Rangers are kinda screwed. While the Rangers are distracted by a monster, Kimberly is lured out of the command center to try to save Cat from some Tengas. However, in her weakened state, she collapses before she can fight them off, and is taken back to one of Zed's dimensions. 
Zed directly contacts the Rangers and demands they teleport him to the command center to issue his demands for Kimberly. As stated before, the command center has defenses to prevent anyone without a power coin from entering. With no other choice, they obey, and for the first time, a lead villain accesses the headquarters of the Rangers. It's pretty damn chilling seeing Zed's chair in the chamber. The lights dim, the area shakes, and everyone is visibly worried by him simply being there. Mind you, Zed's one-liners get pretty tiresome, but the fact that he's actually there is enough. Regardless of how the series has softened him a bit by making him more jokey, he's still evil, sadistic, and powerful. He issues his demands. The Rangers can serve him and be the pilots of his Shogun Zords, or he'll destroy Kimberly, who is currently having her life force drained by one of Zed's machines. They agree, and he departs triumphant. Cat, however, is starting to have doubts about her role in evil. Billy is able to locate the dimension that Kimberly is stuck in, but it's beyond their reach to teleport her out of. Instead, they use the portal devices that they had previously used to access the other dimensions with the green candle and etc. to get in. Tommy goes in after her, but is confronted by Lord Zed. If I haven't made it clear enough, this three-parter is really the highlight of the season. Besides for a couple of slip-ups, the writing is very strong, and a few very unique things happen, like this scene. The first and only time that Lord Zed ever directly fights any of the Rangers. And while Tommy keeps getting tired and gets thrown around like a rag doll, Zed remains strong, even mocking Tommy's constant hi yaing it's only thanks to him shattering Zed's staff that he wins, and even then it's more like a stalemate, since it's obvious that if they'd continued, Zed would have mopped the floor with him. As I said last time, Zed's the Emperor and shouldn't have to become involved in directly dealing with things that threaten his empire. But this fight, and the earlier scene of him in the command center, really shows why he was a genuine force to be reckoned with. Billy manages to rewire the Shogun Zords so they obey their commands instead of Zed's. They've won the day, but the Falcon Zord, Ninjor, and the Pink Power Coin are still in Zed and Rita's possession at the end of the three-parter. To save Kimberly's life, Alpha and Zordon cut off her direct connection to her Power Coin, at least until they can recover it. In the meantime, she'll be able to borrow power from the other Rangers so she can at least morph. Also, apparently the Ninja Zords are inoperable while the Falcon Zord is out of their hands. Not sure why the hell that is, but let's just pretend that makes sense. In what is a really nice touch, Kim and Tommy close out the episode with Kim thinking that it's the end of her career as the Pink Ranger, but Tommy reminds her of how she supported him when he had lost his powers, and that he'll do the same for her. Here's the funny thing about the Shogun Zords versus the Ninja Zords. In Kaku Rangers... The Zords are actually the other way around. The Shogun Zords equivalents were the first robots they got, missing a pink Zord because the Kaku Rangers didn't have a pink team member. Obviously it was switched around since they needed six Zords for six members, and I think it works better that way from a narrative standpoint, anyway. After two seasons with animal-based Zords, suddenly having the third set of Zords be humanoid in shape would be kind of weird. Better to transition into it by having the Shogun Zords be humanoid as a second Megazord. Sadly, the filler episode in between the multi-parters is Follow That Cab. All it does in terms of advancing the story is show more of Kat's backstory, as well as show that Kimberly is going to try to meet with an internationally famous gymnastics coach so she can join his team. Kat is showing more and more signs of resisting Rita's control, so Rita zaps her what good with another blast of evil. It also introduces the Shark Cycles, just in time for kids to have new toys. Even though they can teleport anywhere, thus Shark Cycles make absolutely no sense. Yay! What fascinates me about this episode is that it's an indication that even the criminals in the city are morons, since a car thief steals Kimberly's car in broad daylight with witnesses passing all around him. The story arc comes to a close in A Different Shade of Pink. The coach I mentioned before offers to train Kimberly in preparation for the Pan-Global International Peace Conference Gymnastics whatever thingy. Rita, being the petty villain that she is, dedicates herself to ruining Kimberly's chances with the plan of making her far too exhausted from fighting as a ranger to do so. While Kim has never been one to shirk her responsibilities, since the earlier days she's had a bit less confidence to her and more revulsion at some of the more unseemly things they've had to fight against in the show, and probably would have been fine with retiring if the fight really was over. However, to show that her character has grown, she expresses her worry about neglecting her duties as a ranger since she has to dedicate a good chunk of her time to training. She recognizes that defending Earth and fighting evil is more important 
important than her dreams. However, Zordon tells her that although he's happy that the team is loyal to their duties as Power Rangers, he never meant to deprive them of their normal lives. Just goes to show how awesome and wise Zordon can be when you're not breaking his stuff. Zed and Rita's attack actually is intelligent as they attack multiple locations at once, forcing the team to split their forces. The Rangers manage to force them all together, but not before needing to pull Kimberly away from her gymnastics. After two consecutive fierce battles, Kim returns to the juice bar after hours to practice. As Kat continues to recall her past and how she was taken by Rita, Kimberly starts to lose her balance and gets severely disoriented. The first part ends with Kimberly falling off the balance beam and hitting her head. Kimberly is taken to the hospital, the first of only a few times throughout the entire show's run where injuries were serious enough to justify that, with Kat watching over her. She pulls through and Kat admits to Kimberly that she was working for Zed and Rita. The others are forgiving of her for what happened, considering Tommy's own history of being turned evil. Though one wonders if she admitted that they've been stroking her this whole time when she was their cat. Speaking of, did she lose that ability? Or are they implying that cats are naturally evil, thus you can only turn into one if you have evil in your heart? Rita contacts the rangers and tells them that if they don't surrender Cat, they'll banish Ninjor to some evil, dark place of evil. I don't know, <laughs> Sea of Sorrows, they call it. But really, knowing this show, it's evil place of evil number 37. <laughs> Showing some forward Hello. initiative, the rangers show up for the exchange, but they place a force field around Cat to protect her. However, the villains, of course, try to hang hand them an empty jar, so this was all kind of pointless. The Tengas attack and the force field is disabled, letting them take Cat. However, Cat manages to escape her cell and gets the pink power coin. Alpha detects the coin entering the hands of someone good, and they realign the teleportation system to get her back. Kimberly gets accepted into the pan-global whatever, but it means she has to move to Florida. At first, Kimberly is reluctant to go because of her duties as a ranger, but the others convince her that she should follow her dreams. Cat is granted the pink power coin, Yet, they don't need a big sword to transfer the powers. Hmm, interesting, isn't it? Although what's even more interesting is that at one point, Zordon suggests that Kim could later return to reclaim her place as a Power Ranger. While that never happens, the idea of taking back earlier powers is something that'll be touched upon in later seasons. And so another member of the original Five leaves, although this time handled with at least giving the actress a send-off instead of shipping them off to a peace conference off-screen. Unlike all the previous Rangers, Cat isn't much of a martial artist and has to rely on the enhanced ninja powers to deal with threats against her. However, she does do fairly well, and while she may not be a karate expert, it was established in A Different Shade of Pink that she's a swimmer, and later that she's a ballet dancer, so she definitely has her own unique traits to bring to the table, and eventually she becomes an adept fighter, much like how the others had to develop their skills over time. Which does bring me to another point that I kind of skimmed over in the last video when Jason, Zack, and Trini left the show. The thing is, when the show started, the five were given fairly two-dimensional personalities, but they were at least personalities, and the actors did adjust them over time. However, when they left, Adam, Rocky, and Aisha didn't really have much in terms of personality. Don't get me wrong, as I said, they were perfectly good actors, but their characters weren't given much to work with. Heck, even I would have a hard time pinning down Tommy's personality other than how it related to his relationship to the others, particularly Kimberly or when he took Jason's spot as leader of the team. Kat sadly has the same problem over time. Her inexperience was touched upon only a little bit in her opening episodes as the Pink Ranger, the rest of the time simply taking her place for the plots of the day like the others. Everyone left on the team is pretty much a blank slate. We're told things about them, but nothing that significant. It's probably one of the reasons why interest in the show was beginning to wane. While there were things happening plot-wise that had longer consequences, it was getting harder to invest in characters that didn't really have arcs or development. Plus, it was harder to fall back on just having awesome fight scenes to carry stuff since the audience had now seen over 100 episodes of that by this point. After a few more filler episodes, the storyline continued with Master Vile and the Metallic Armor. The episode starts off ominously. An earthquake occurs and the sky darkens. When the Rangers teleport to the command center, they find the place offline and Alpha disabled. Even Zordon is missing. Up in the palace, Master Vile, Rita and Rito's father, and ruler of the M51 galaxy arrives. The command center comes back online, their power temporarily being cut off thanks to Master Vile's arrival. Master Vile is very powerful in his own right, and he immediately butts head with Zed, probably pissed he didn't get invited to the wedding. It's hard not to see his point, seeing as the dude owns his own galaxy, while Zed and Rita are having issues with one planet. 
Although that does make me wonder what the hell Zed was doing while Rita was in the trash can for 10,000 years. Fortunately, Zordon's been working on an all-new defense mechanism for the Rangers. Metallic armor that will further protect them. Wow, an entire new set of armor designed to better withstand attacks? That's fantastic! And what will this new armor look like? Will it be some sort of a blade of armor that folds out? Will it be boxy or smooth? Will it reflect their new animals? Well, the answer is... It's frickin' glitter! Yeah, thanks, Zordon. Thanks a ton for this new armor. You're still pissed about the team breaking the Zords, aren't you? I'm so, like, and, and looking at how, how it was lit, it's like, so you basically just laminated the, the costumes? <laughs> that's what, at least that's what it looks like to me. Anyway. I'm sorry, but the metallic armor is so half-assed, I can't even believe they bothered. When I think armor, I think the USS Voyager's Batmobile armor. I think the Chobham armor on a Gundam. Hell, I even think that armor Matt LeBlanc was sporting in Lost in Space. Yeah. I do not think glitter. What makes it worse is that half the time you can't even tell if they've got it on or not because the yeah. Rangers' outfits are already pretty brightly colored. Yeah. From what I've read, this was just done to try to get kids to buy leftover stock of the toys from the movie, even though said toys actually looked metallic since they used metallic paint on them instead of friggin' glitter! Oh, I'm sorry, it also makes them blurry as if they're moving at super speed, because if there's anything that a heavier material like metal is known for, it's making things faster. And of course, just like jetting, they barely ever used it. Yeah. Thanks for taking us out of the story again to remind us that you are a toy commercial. Anyway, as for the story itself, Master Vile insults Zed for a bit. Zed counters that they've still got Ninjor and the Falcon Zord. However, Rito trips while carrying Ninjor's jar, causing the jar to fall and shatter. Ninjor manages to escape, but not before hearing Master Vile say that he's searching for something called the Zeo Crystal. You know, I might as well call it the MacGuffin Crystal. I mean, we know this show, right? Sword of Light, Sword of Power, various bits of technology and other mystical hoodoo show up all the time, and yet they never have any long-term consequences beyond their initial episode. So I'm sure the same will be the case for this thing. Oh. Yeah, it's already over? Hmm, guess so. Uh, well, it's just as well. My laptop battery is at, like, 19%, so... That's the first half of Season 3 of Mighty Morphin Power Rangers. Kimberly says her goodbyes. I, I liked Kimberly, although, let's face it, a lot of, a lot of boys growing up in the, in the 90s liked Kimberly, and they know what I mean by that. After Amy Jo Johnson left Power Rangers, she went on to co-star in the show Felicity opposite Kerry Russell. That show was created by J.J. Abrams and Matt Reeves. They made some stuff you might have seen before. Over the last 10 years or so, she's made the leap to directing, making a few short films, an indie film, and this year she directed her first TV show episode for the CW's Superman and Lois. And that's a great show, by the way, so kudos to her, man. She's done pretty well for herself after leaving the pink spandex behind. Let me know what you thought of Season 3, or at least these episodes of Season 3, in the comments down below. And as always, if you like what you saw here, feel free to click that like button. It helps me quite a bit. Share this video with your friends if you enjoyed it. And if you haven't done so already, please subscribe. Um, yeah... Wondered, yeah, my battery is running low on my laptop. I'll probably just watch uh, part two of season three through the TV next time, so. But you're not going to notice that anyway, so. Why am I saying this? <laughs> I'm Mark Aquino. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time. Don't forget to click below to subscribe to the official Mark Aquino YouTube channel.